Well, I should say, ladies and gentlemen, but <laughs> 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 you should look carefully. But uh, anyway, I have a question to introduce John Sebastian Simon. I don't know the age of that name. Simon, okay, so three names I should remember. <laughs> and he joined our group, let's say, in academy. <laughs> he did his PhD in Kanazawa in, in Japan, which is also not true. And before he was, uh, he, he's from Philippines and he did his bachelor and magister study in, in Philippines. And he did this uh, shape optimization. He is extremely enthusiastic, you will see. And today he will speak about a nice formulation of maximizing the computational capability of the twin world cycle of the VI shape optimization. So, please. Hello, everyone. Uh... Thank you for the introduction. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So yeah, so my talk is about a naive formulation of maximizing the computational capability of the thin vortex computer via shape optimization. So um let me begin with. How, what is a twin vortex computer? So it uh, roots back to a, a basic neural network and a basic, as we all know, a basic neural network uh, uh, basically uh, contains some input layer, some hidden layers and some output layer. And in a basic neural network, the way it's connecting the input layer and the hidden layers are optimized while as well as the uh, weights that the matrix that connects the hidden layers are also optimized and also from the hidden layers the uh, output layers so and uh, now uh, a, another way of um, doing this stuff is uh, what they call the reservoir layer here we have a fixed reservoir now and again an input layer a reservoir layer and an output layer. However, here the, the, the matrix that connects the input layer to the reservoir layer is fixed as well as the ways that connects the nodes in the reservoir layer. And what is optimized is the uh, matrix that connects the reservoir layer to the output layer. So um, basically this uh, kind of uh, paradigm um, takes advantage of the nonlinear connections of the nodes inside the reservoir layer. And uh, a new paradigm that, uh, yeah, it's new, is uh, called the physical reservoir computer, where uh, instead of having several nodes, people now use a physical system and they uh, take advantage of the nonlinear dynamics in a physical system. So, and, uh, uh, Kohei Nakajima is uh, one of the people known to do this kind of stuff, uh, uh, coined this phrase and said, uh, understanding the fundamental relationship between physics and information processing capability. Now, uh, uh, the main focus of this talk is uh, the so-called twin vortex computer, which was published uh, last year, in 2021. And here they take advantage of the twin vortex, the nonlinear dynamics of the twin vortex that happens up, uh, after this uh, cylinder here. And uh, so what they do is on the input boundary, they have an input boundary here. And uh, here they set up several nodes, which they call the reservoir. So what they do is, uh, they take advantage of that nonlinear dynamics and test this machine to some uh, to several tasks. Number one is the memory capacity task, and they showed that for the usual uh, echo state network, uh, it works uh, better than the usual echo state network for um, basically yeah for almost every task and yeah and as they uh, observed. The, the optimal uh, capacity of this reservoir computer works well on Reynolds number 45, 
which is the point where the uh, the twin vortex transitions into the Kármán vortex numerically. So, um, and coincidentally, they have shown that as as the twin vortex gets longer, the computational capability, meaning this memory task and ARMA task, uh, are more um, satisfied. So the question here that was posed by my supervisor when I started this is how do we improve the computational capability of twin vortex computer? And uh, so uh, he asked me if we can change the domain, uh, the shape of the cylinder, and can we optimize such um, computational capability? And so that is what I will be talking about here today. And I call it naive because it's hard to really quantify what is the computational, how do we quantify the computational capability of this uh, computer? So, yeah, so the outline of this talk will be, first I will be introducing the shape optimization constrained with the Navier-Stokes equations. And I will be talking about the existence of state solutions and sensitivity analysis. And then I will do some numerics to uh, illustrate how uh, the, the, the shape of the cylinder changes and how it affects the twin vortex. So yeah, shape optimization constrained with the Navier-Stokes equations. So here, simply we minimize the following. We have here a perimeter functional. And here to quantify the vortex, we have the L2 norm of the curl and the determinant of the gradient of the velocity u. Here, lambda 1 and lambda 2 are two weight parameters, which are uh, chosen to uh, determine the, um, how to say, the which one we will prioritize to minimize. And uh, this perimeter function acts as a, a Tikhonov regularizer of the optimization problem. And uh, um, we consider the following uh, Navier-Stokes equations, stationary Navier-Stokes equations. And here we uh, consider a um, cylinder. And in that cylinder, we have a, ah, sorry, a channel and we have a an obstacle, which is a cylinder here. We denote this as gamma in. We call it, uh, we denote this as gamma wall or gamma w. And this is a gamma. Uh, and this is gamma f for uh, free, which is the control. And uh, as you notice, we don't have a um, boundary condition on gamma out yet. Yeah. And uh, that is what uh, I had to uh, think about next. And uh, oh yeah, I forgot. Here you add is uh, known as the set of admissible domains. It is contained in a Hodel domain D, which is open, at least of class C11. And we also consider a uh, volume constraint on the domains. And uh, here G is uh, a smoothing function because here what we want is uh, to maximize the positivity of the gradient. So, uh, yeah. so yeah, talking about the um, boundary condition on gamma out, I had to consider several boundary conditions. But sorry. So here the variable u denotes the fluid velocity, p is the pressure, f is a given uh, external force, u in is a given um, boundary force here in the input uh, boundary. And uh, alpha, gamma one, ah, lambda one and lambda two are weight parameters and n is a volume constraint. M is the uh, constraint on the volume of the domain. So for the candidates for the outflow condition on gamma out, first, of course, we can think of the do nothing condition and uh, the directional do nothing condition. However, for the do nothing condition, um, if we try to show coercivity, when we try to uh, show the existence of fixed solutions, there's this extra term that comes out, which is, uh, I think, something like this. Uh, you. And for coercivity, we have to determine the sign of. Oh. 
So we have to determine the sign of that term if we use the do nothing condition, but we have no control of that yet. So several authors, including uh, Braaf and uh, Piotr Muha, I think, use this uh, directional do nothing to control the sign of this so that we get the coercivity of the uh, operator when we go to the weak existence. However, for this kind of boundary condition, we have this uh, u dot n minus here. Basically, this part gets only the negative part of u dot n. And if we try to do a, a joint um, a joint method, uh, at some point when we try to write the joint method, we get something like this. So for example, this is the joint variable and this is a test function coming up of rewriting the adjoint system. So I don't like this because we have a test function inside this uh, negative part here. So I said, uh, why not consider this instead, which is actually can be written as uh, negative pn, that's new partial n, new minus one, uh, so now the question is can we get good uh can we prove existence of big solutions for this kind of system including this uh, convective boundary condition and uh, yeah numerically it also if uh, for appropriate the uh, value of u in this boundary condition also uh, exhibits good outflow condition numerically as uh, we have found out so yeah so for the analysis on the state equations of course step one is to formulate the variational equation corresponding to the perturbed version of the state equations so we have to lift u in the input velocity under some uh, arbitrary uh, velocity throughout the domain and uh, next is is that uh, lifting really warranted? It can we really, is there really a velocity that can be extended on the domain and can we get coercivity now? And the next one is the final uh, goal is to show the existence of the solutions to these equations. So step one, we get an arbitrary function, which is in H1. And uh, of course we want it to agree with the boundary conditions here. Is it zero here? And uh, is it doing there? But for now, we don't care. And we shall show that on the second step. But let us, we will write the a week, the variational equation with this uh, perturbed uh, version. So here we define u tilde as u minus w, and we can write the Navier Stokes equations as follows. And so uh, by introducing the following operators here, this is the bilinear form, the uh, usual bilinear form. This is the uh, pressure divergence uh, bilinear form. And uh, A sub 1 is the usual trilinear form on the uh, domain. A sub 2 is the trilinear form that comes out of the uh, boundary condition. And uh, next is we write A as the combination of these um, this A's here. And phi is just the collection of all those given data. We can. Yeah. The goal is find u tilde that satisfies this. for showing the coercivity of uh, this term here. So if we, so if we substitute u tilde, will, will this be coercive as well as, yeah. So the problem comes out when we have, for example, if we do the diagonal testing, we have this term here, k1. Mm -hmm. 
K1 U W this is the uh, distant function minus A2 W. So you, you would want to control this this term here because if these two are the same, they cancel out. So later on, if we try to substitute it, all all of those terms that has equal parts here will cancel out. But this third, these two terms will just be there, and so we have to control that part. So yeah, so and uh, this is the result that we were able to get. So if we have a an input uh, force, which is in H3 over two, and for any bar sigma, we can find actually a vector W, which is in H2 such that it is divergence free. It coincides with the boundary conditions that we need. And we can get the following estimate. So uh, for the sketch of the proof, of course, we use this uh, classic uh, result to get a certain um, vector W0 that coincides with U in on omega uh, on gamma in. It is zero on. So I denote that these two, these three, sorry, four, four portions as gamma zero. And uh, so W0 is zero on these parts here, here, except for this part. Because we need W to be equal to UE, and it is divergence free as well. So the next one is um, so we have a divergence free function. Now we can also use a classical uh, result, which says that we can find a stream function such that the curl of this stream function is equal to such velocity. So we can write W0 as curl of the stream function. And actually, we can choose this stream function to be zero on, on gamma w. Yeah, so, but the thing now is we want to control this part here. Oh, sorry. What did I do? So we want to control this part here. So we will utilize some uh, cutoff function and uh, here uh, it is the cutoff function is one on a boundary of here and zero elsewhere. And we define omega zero epsilon as a curl of theta epsilon psi. And uh, we can check, of course, W zero epsilon is equal to U in here. And uh, they are zero here. And because it is curl of some stream function, the divergence is zero. So yeah, so our goal now is to show that uh, if we evaluate this part here, we can bound it to some C epsilon tilde, where C epsilon tilde goes to zero as epsilon approaches zero. And in such case, we can choose epsilon small enough so that C tilde would be smaller than var sigma. So, of course, the domain, domain, the domain integral part has been done by Giro and Pravyar. And uh, so our uh, main focus is to estimate this boundary integral here. And yeah, so holders inequality, we have this, we have this L4 squared here, and we have this uh, L2 norm of W0 epsilon. And uh, writing explicitly W0 epsilon, because it is equal to the curl of uh, theta epsilon psi, we can actually uh, estimate it like this. So we have sum of two terms here. And here, this psi here is not dependent on epsilon. So if we try to uh, take epsilon approach to zero, this also becomes smaller. So the part that we that is problematic here is this part, because even though if we even though we have epsilon here, uh, here we have the distance of s to gamma zero, gamma zero, and if we approach epsilon to zero, that part also goes smaller. So we have to know if we can control this quantity here. So yeah, that's why I put a red highlight on that part. And um, 
Luckily, we can write this um, integral as a one-dimensional integral according to the parametrization of the boundary. And uh, using, um, what do you call this? This inequality here, we can uh, bound it by the integral of P prime. And the uh, P prime can be written as the gradient of psi. And so we can get this L2 norm of the gradient. And uh, look, uh, finally, we get this uh, final inequality here. Here, C1 epsilon is the uh, estimate uh, gathered from Gerard and Raviar and this terms here is the one from this computation. And so as we can see this whole part here goes to zero as epsilon approaches zero. And so that proves that uh, lifting lemma. And uh, now we can show the existence of solutions. So the complicated part, uh, the crucial part here is just the coercivity because it follows usual arguments now. So yeah, and use this uh, classic uh, result for proving existence of stationary solutions for the non stokes equations. And uh, so we want to find alpha such that we have this uh, nonlinear coercivity here. And if we evaluate A omega with these three variables here, we can write it like this. And you see here, this and uh, this cancels out as well as this and this part. So what remains is this, and that is what we can now control because of the lemma that we just have proven. So, yeah. and we choose uh, var sigma to be new over two, so that uh, yeah we can control it from below, and we get we get this theorem for the existence of solutions, and we also get this uh, uniqueness assumption. Which is the smallness assumption for stationary navier stokes equations. So, yeah. So uh, I will skip the existence of shape solutions because uh, it follows uh, usual arguments. So you will need domain to state continuity. So if you have changing domains, what happens to the state? Will it have some sort of a continuity? But uh, I will talk about the uh, shape sensitivity analysis, which will be used for. Uh, the numerics that I will present later on. So for the domain variations, we have a whole domain D and uh, we consider this set of admissible domains. Um, so we have the gamma F, which is free boundary. So we will use the following identity perturbation operator, which is perturbed by this theta, which is uh, C11 from the closure of the whole domain to R2, which is uh, zero on the boundary of the whole domain and all of the boundaries of omega except on the free boundary. So that the only thing that changes is this part. All right, so, so for the sensitivity analysis, we will use rearrangement method and the rearrangement method works on the following uh, elements. So first they considered this Banach space that is dependent on the domain's omega. And they have a given operator, which uh, uh, corresponds to the uh, PDE that uh, constrains the shape optimization problem and a given objective functional of the following form. So they study this rearrangement method studies the following minimization problem. And uh, here, basically, they want to study the following um, definition of shape derivative. So it takes the limit of the objective function evaluated at yt, where yt is the solution to the PDE on the domains which are perturbed by this identity operate, uh, identity perturbation operator. So, yeah. So in our case, our uh, operator is the velocity pressure operator defined by this one. And uh, we know that if uh, we know that this has a root because of the uh, existence analysis that we have shown a while ago. And uh, 
here our objective function is the following so here alpha ds which is this one and we have this we define this whole term here as j of y so basically the rearrangement method just checks out if we can use uh, implicit function theorem and then what uh, they did is they have rewritten it to sort of just skip taking the shape derivative of the state and passing it immediately to the adjoint uh, state. So the first hypothesis that they would want to check is if they, you would want to find a an operator defined on y omega cross zero tau, which is the uh, param parameter that we considered for the perturbation of domains, such that this uh, equation e y t omega t equals zero is equivalent to e tilde y t t equals zero. Note that y raised to t here is an element of y omega, while y y sub t here is an element of y omega t because it's easier to analyze things on a fixed domain so we're we're pushing back things on the fixed domain and here e till there will be the following uh, operator which basically just uh, we're just pushing everything back to the so if we have omega t using the transformation, the identity perturbation operator, we will uh, transform them back to the original domain. And we can easily see for um, <coughs> basically if the, the norm of theta, which is the deformation field, is I think less than one, then we can get this, uh, we can get this kind of uh, result here. So for the second uh, some, uh, hypothesis that we have to uh, satisfy is that the free shape derivative EY exists and it satisfies this, of course. So we just have to check. It, it can be shown easily because this is a uh, second order uh, operator can be easily shown. And we can show that uh, the adjoint system has a unique solution given that uh, here y is the unique solution of the state equations so yeah and h4 again i will skip this part so from if all of those four hypotheses are satisfied then we can actually uh, determine the shape derivative of the objective function and it is given by this part here so here we have the mean curvature of the free boundary here this is the object the uh, integral of the objective function and uh, here this is the time derivative of e tilde y of t multiplied to the adjoint variable the adjoint variable is the equation of this uh, adjoint equation here All right so now it, we can actually easily determine this time derivative because we are passing the uh, time dependence not on the domain now because if we still have the time dependence on the domain it would be problematic so if we have a fixed domain and then take the derivative with respect to time it is now easier so the rigorous part here is this or the tedious part here is solving for this but then uh, we were able to simplify this to this following theorem if the assumptions on the uh, existence theorem are true and including the uh, smallness assumption on the data then uh, given given an element of the whole domain and a given a deformation field then we can determine the eulerian derivative and it is it can be written as that one and we can also write explicitly the uh, because it's the adjoint variable and it satisfies the following Austin equations. And here we see that uh, P is uh, determined as this vector here and R is this one. Now for the numerics, um, yeah, so 
So we solve the fluid using Taylor Hood finite elements and the navier stokes equations using Newton's method. And uh, well, we use those equations later on because uh, we have to solve, uh, we have to satisfy the following uh, volume constraint. And here we use, we, we would want to solve theta. Now, if you notice a while ago, the, the sheet derivative was written into something like this. The theta. So this is called the zolesho hadamard structure. And if we choose theta to be equal to negative gradient of n on omega f, then we know that dj would be equal to negative norm square root of theta. So yeah, and this is less than or equal to uh, zero. So we get a sort of a descent gradient. However, if we explicitly define this on gamma f, that causes uh, some um, irregularity on the perturbed domain. So what people do is use different traction methods. And uh, usually peop uh, people use augmented Lagrangian method because of this uh, domain constraint here. And here we uh, numerically uh, propose a Stokes traction method because here if in the divergence of theta, the divergence of theta is equal to zero, then even if we change the domain using the uh, identity perturbation operator, we are assured that every domain is uh, the, the yeah every domain has the same volume. So yeah, so the Stokes traction method basically we are extending theta on the whole domain by solving the following uh, Robin problem. So basically we have negative Laplacian of theta equals zero or theta equals zero and partial n theta. We have a parameter here equal to negative gradient of Jn so that for small enough uh, alpha theta would be equal to negative gradient of Jn on gamma x. So, but the Stokes structure method now incorporates some divergence-free assumption on theta. While the augmented Lagrangian method, this is adapted on the work of the Pogni and his uh, collaborators where they form the following augmented Lagrangian here, F is the uh, volume constraint. And so they actually solve for the gradient of this L hat here, and then just solve usual Robin problem without the divergence free assumption. So here's our algorithm. Of course, we initialize a domain and solve the state equations and then evaluate so that we can solve for the adjoint variable, the mean curvature and the deformation field. And then we try perturbing the domain under appropriate value of this parameter t raised to k here, and then solve new solutions and then check and then repeat until convergence. So first we check the effects of the weight parameters. So here's our initial domain. We start with the circle and then we perturb it using this algorithm. And uh, curl df basically we set uh, lambda one to one, lambda two to zero and alpha to five. And as you can see from circle, it evolves into a lean shaped boundary. While if we have uh, a lambda equal to zero, lambda two equal to one and alpha equal to one, then it evolves into something like this. Now, what happens if they are both positive? So for this, uh, I call this the mixed DF problem. And here I 
use different values of alpha from 6 to 15. Uh, sorry, that should be lambda. Lambda is 6 and gamma 2 is uh, 1 to 10. Because basically with these configurations, we can write our objective function as this one. And this is the configuration number. And I call this the curl part of the objective function. And I call this the that grad part of the objective function. And I compared the shapes, what happens to the shapes as we increase the configuration. So for the first configuration, the solution of the mixed problem is almost the same as the curl. And then if we increase the configuration, we see that it almost converges to the solution of the that grad problem. And yeah, so we see here configuration one is the blue one, which is almost the same as the solution of the curl. And configuration 10, we actually see some similarity with the solution of the that grad problem. Now, uh, I also compared the traction methods. So this is the solution of the Lagrangian method. And uh, it's, as you can see, the volume is, uh, res is uh, preserved in a respectable uh, value because this is only the difference. So here we have from initial, it is 1.94699. And the value at the final iteration is 6.49. And uh, one notable thing here is, this part here on the left side of the uh, boundary is almost flat. While if we check the stoke, ah, sorry, I also check what happens to the shape and to the uh, uh, stringence of the constraint if we change the uh, some parameters. But yeah, I'll skip that part. But here, the stoke traction method, we, we kind of uh, get some curvature here. And as you can see, it uh, preserves the volume better. So after 94 iterations, we get this very small difference from the initial domain to the final domain. And as you can see here, I actually uh, compared them side by side. And yeah, the volume is actually preserved for the stoke structure method. And one good thing about the stoke structure method is if you look at the augmented Lagrangian method, we have these parameters here, L and B over two, which are supposed to be uh, optimized as well. However, for the Stokes traction method, we just have to solve for the uh, Stokes equation with the Robin boundary conditions, which is for me more convenient, even though, of course, here for the augmented Lagrangian method, the uh, algorithm on stops at the 30th iteration, while the Stokes traction method stops at the 94th iteration. So I just have to wait. Instead of just finding for the good parameter, I can just wait, which is for me more convenient. And uh, I also tried some two obstacle experiment just to see what our uh, what happens to the shapes. So we have two setups, one is perpendicular and one is parallel to the flow. And this one is the parallel to the flow, I mean. So because our flow it flows like that, so I put the obstacles like that. So our boundary evolves into something like this. So basically the part that facing the inflow lengthens. And for the uh, setup that is perpendicular to the flow, we also get that way. So my conjecture is our algorithm tries, what, what it does is it tries to lengthen the, the face of the boundary that is facing the inflow because, yeah, yeah. And uh, if I also check what happens to the, uh, optimal shapes, if I change the domain triangulations, of course, it becomes finer, but does it affect the optimality of the system? And uh, here I, I actually took a manufactured solution, which is derived from a very fine mesh and a very high polynomial uh, basis. And I compared it to coarse meshes and P2P1 
of Taylor Hood elements. And you can see that as, uh, as the mesh size becomes small, the uh, Hausdorff distance go, becomes smaller, meaning we have convergence of the domains, numerical domains. And here we also see the volume deviation. We see that the change in the domain, even for coarse mesh, is respectable for this kind of method, which is the Stokes traction method. While if we use the augmented Lagrangian method, we see that, yes, of course, the Hausdorff distance becomes smaller, but the uh, volume preservation is not that good. You can see here the volume deviation using the augmented Lagrangian method is quite high for very coarse meshes. And of course, if we take the uh, mesh size smaller, then yeah, can get good um, volume preservation. And yeah, this is just to uh, a naive comparison on what happens on the uh, twin vortex if we use one of the optimal shapes, but I don't think this is working. So again, I'll just show you the video here. So, sorry. So as you can see on the top, I cut this video. The lower part is for the part where the, the obstacle is just circle while the top part is the obstacle is evolving right so what happens to the twin vortex is it becomes bigger as we change the domain and uh, yeah hopefully this uh, result this enlargement of the twin vortex is meaningful which is um, what uh, my phd supervisor and one of his students is still doing. Yeah, so con just to conclude, we considered vortex maximization using shape optimization. Here, uh, I also used the convective boundary condition upon which I also proved some uh, lifting uh, lemma, which is that part. And uh, I computed the shape of shape derivative of the functional with the perimeter regularizer and I also proposed a slope structure method to uh, satisfy this volume constraint. And yeah, thank you for listening. And all of this result is a, a compilation of the following papers. And yeah. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. So